nobody's ever made an impact in life being normal. So when I explained it to my mom, that's how I explained it. Um, normality sucks. You, you can be normal, be average. You're never going to make an impact on the world. If I get a Bayern Munich eyeball, I'm practically shunning normality. I'm, I'm putting myself out there um, with a Bayern Munich eyeball. Instantly, it's a, it's a conversation piece. So I walk up and say hey to somebody. They look at me weird, and they're like, dude, what, what's up with your eye? And then that opens up the door to explaining who Bayern Munich is, what Bayern Munich is, um, explaining the passion and, and fandom of Bayern Munich, as well as it, it opens the door for a conversation that eventually, if you talk about Bayern Munich and stuff like that about your eye, there's going to come that time when they're like, well, what happened? How'd you lose it? And that opens you up to practically being able to bring awareness to an ultra rare cancer. That is Ryan Gibson this week on the do it for yourself podcast. everybody. How's it going? Welcome or welcome back to another episode here on the Do It For Yourself podcast. My name is Ian and I am the host here on the Do It For Yourself podcast. And before we get into who I have on the podcast for this episode, I would like to ask you very quickly if you could leave me a review on whatever app it is that you are using to listen to this podcast. Something that is super easy to do, but something that helps me out tremendously. This week, my guest is Ryan Gibson. And before I get into who Ryan is, I just want to let you know that Ryan and I talked for a little bit longer than what I am used to posting. So the way that this is going to work is the same way that my episode worked. I am going to split this into two. So right now you are listening to the first part. And then in a couple days, you are going to get the second half of this interview. So here's to Ryan. Ryan is someone who has an experience and a story that I have yet to been able to share here on the podcast. And that is because Ryan had a extremely rare case of cancer in his eye and had to have his eye removed. And so when he was going for his prosthetic eye, it wasn't even a thought. He knew right from the start, he was going to get a Bayern Munich logo prosthetic eye. And it's something that has led to um, a little bit of press. And it's something that he gets a lot of questions about, but it's something that he feels like opens up the conversation a little bit more to talk about this extremely rare case of eye cancer. So that is the first half of the story that we get into. And in the second half of his story, we get a chance to talk about the car accident that he was in um, and how that impacted his legs, his mobility, and now ultimately the rest of his life, but it has not impacted his outlook nor his attitude. So I am really looking forward to sharing this interview with you. Um, Ryan and I got to talking and we couldn't stop. So that is why we ended up going for so long. Um, But this is the first half of the interview and I hope you enjoy. So Ryan, I just want to say um, thank you so much for 
joining me this evening on the Do It For Yourself podcast. Um, I am really, really looking forward to sharing your story, um, talking about how motivating and everything it is that you've done. Um, and I think that this is definitely going to be a first on the Do It For Yourself podcast. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, but just do me a quick favor um, and let everybody know who you are, where you're from, um, and some just some brief intro points. Um, I mean, starting off, it's kind of, kind of worried me when you said that I'm the first for something that that's kind of interesting, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Ryan Gibson, um, from Clover, South Carolina. A lot of people know me as, as Byron Ryan. Um, I'll, I'll eventually we'll explain how that all came to pass, um, a little later. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, um, I mean, I'm the, the, the Byron Ryan is the, the, the guy with the Bayern Munich eyeball. Um, I've been featured in multiple um, international features on social media videos or YouTube, which I guess is still social media, but I put it in a different category. Um, and countless articles um, in probably 40, 50 different languages. Um, so, I mean, there's a close to 100. 60, 170 million, um, impressions ish. Um, I stopped counting after a while cause it just gets weird. So, uh, yeah, around 170 million ish impressions, um, of my eye and yeah. So, I mean, somebody from small town, South Carolina getting that much exposure and that's a majority of it's international, not really, um, in the U S that's kind of a weird feeling. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's kind of the brief overview. And this is all surrounding your, as you said, your Bayern Munich um, eyeball. And for people who may just be thinking right off the bat, well, first of all, what is Bayern Munich? And second of all, what does Ryan mean when he says he has a Bayern Munich eyeball? <clears throat> Um, let's, let's just jump into those two things right there. So for people who are listening that may not know, can you just explain who Bayern Munich is? Um, Bayern Munich is a European football club. Um, a, a German foosball, um, is what we call it. Or in the United States, it, it would be classified as like a German soccer team. Mm -hmm. Um, it is heads and shoulders above the rest of the German soccer world as far as trophies, titles, um, some of their, the greatest players that have ever come out of the country of Germany, um, some of the greatest players that have ever put on a German jersey. Um, all of them came from the, the Bayern Munich system. Um, and I mean, it's... If you ask me, we're the, the greatest team in the history of Europe. If you ask somebody else, they may say somebody else. But, I mean, to me, it's it's the greatest family that a, a one-eyed, one-legged person could ever have. Um, it's a support structure that originally I, I, I didn't expect was going to happen, but the more obstacles and adversities in life I've come to find out that, that that family means just as much as the, the, the blood family that I have. So, I mean, the, the Bayern Munich red kind of runs in the blood just as much as, you know what I'm saying? Just regular family does. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's some people could attribute, I guess, um, Bayern Munich to a, kind of like the new england patriots as far as as dominance um you can you could attribute it to like say the a dynasty that just continues on um so i mean it's something everyone should check out um i, I highly recommend becoming a member of the Bayern munich family um even if you're a fan of another soccer team 
just forget them and come to Bayern Munich. <laughs> and so you're now your Bayern Munich eyeball. We'll get into the full story about that, but just for people who are wondering, you do quite literally have a Bayern Munich logo on your eyeball and no it is not a tattoo um but we we will most certainly get into how that came to be but the first thing that i want to get into before that is how did you become such a a diehard Bayern munich fan i know that you know you had some ties with with <clears throat> germany and soccer um through your grandfather but how mm. how did you really become such a huge fan of this football organization um i mean i was it, it's one of those things that i mean kids in the united states have that um connection when they're they're born you know what i'm saying you're you're born a an alabama fan or you're born a clemson fan you're born a packers fan or something like that and it just blossoms from there um for me i was born a Bayern munich fan um, my grandfather was a, a Bayern Munich fan. My father was a Bayern Munich fan. Um, my dad was born in Germany, um, while my grandfather served in the military over there. Um, my mother's family is originally from the, the Northern Bavarian area, which if you call them Bavarian, they'll lose their mind because they say they're Franconian, which we won't get into that, but um, so, I mean, my, my, my mother's family is Bavarian. Um, my dad's original side of his family is Bavarian. So, I mean, it, the Bavarian blood runs through me and that, that's just what I was born into and hearing stories from my grandfather about the, uh, the old Bayern squads that, that were there before I was born. Um, I know kids nowadays probably wouldn't understand that 1982 to 1987 ish, um, trying to find out how your, how your team is doing, you find out a month and a half, maybe two months later, <clears throat> unless you do an international phone call. And we all, if you're above the age of 35, you kind of understand that international phone calls in the eighties, I mean, you're paying <laughs> what, two, <laughs> two, three dollars a minute. Probably. So I mean, you didn't, you didn't, t you didn't talk very long. Um, so I mean, you would get that type of information if you wanted to get it like within weeks. Um, but back then, it was you did a like a call a week or maybe a call every two weeks. So I would get Bayern information then, or they would mail newspapers. Um, letters, VHS tapes, so we could watch it. But I mean, you're you're watching games that were taped off of a TV, um, a month, month and a half, two months prior. So, I mean, it it it, it was really hard being a fan in the '80s, early '90s, even mid '90s, um, because you you just really couldn't find anything unless. It, once the 90s showed up and you had ESPN and then they, they would play like say world cup finals on uh, CBS's wide world of sports or something like that. Mm -hmm. You'd get lucky and see Germany play in a, in a semifinal or, or Germany play in a, a final or may catch some German games on uh, that type of stuff for the world cup. But as far as like Bundesliga games, the only time you would ever see Bayern play would be, highlights mm -hmm. of you know what i'm saying during the world cup right, uh, right but then in 1994 when the the world cup came to the u.s um we went to the world cup games um and watched germany play so that that was one of the first times i got to see it but you know what i'm saying we saw other teams in other countries and stuff so it just during those times you kind of had to be a college football fan or an NBA fan or an NFL fan just to take up the time. Um, and also to kind of fit in because it's, you are kind of an outcast when you sit there and say, yeah, I'm a Bayern Munich fan, but yet eighties, nineties, you didn't, you didn't have jerseys that kids could wear hats. Kids could wear 
like merchandise stuff like they do now. Right. And you, um, I'm sure you probably weren't, obviously this was well before internet and, and, oh, and yeah. e-commerce and all that. So it's not like you could even go online and order these things the way that you can now. I mean, you could probably order any sort of Bayern Munich gear that you could ever possibly want directly from them and have it shipped to your house. Yeah. I mean, now you can't once, once the internet arrived, um, and kids nowadays still aren't going to understand the, the dial up tones. And, uh, <laughs> hey mom, get off the phone, that type of stuff. Um, but once like AOL and stuff like that came up, you could get some quicker news. Right. Um, and really the reason you could only get it quicker was because in, in the early days of AOL, you really couldn't get anything that wasn't English. Um, you know what I'm saying? It was really kind of like coded to, to a region. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it took a long time to find, and with, with dial up connections and, and all that kind of stuff, we all know that, that lived through that time frame how long it took to upload one page, let alone <laughs> trying to search, even though you didn't know where you were searching. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's grown easier as, as the years have passed. Um, and as the years have passed and the technology's grown and more and more information you can follow, you can watch YouTube videos to your heart's content. You can follow transfer rumors you can follow just uh even fan stories and fan blogs and and, and all of these sorts of things podcasts or, or internet radio stuff it's easier to become a super fan now than it was then especially being in the united states and you obviously you didn't have to become a super fan you were already you know a super fan but you have this diagnosis that that comes over and so first i, I want to talk about you know what the diagnosis was and, and what it felt like when you received the news of that diagnosis before we get into the decision that you made um after the diagnosis was given to you and and what your plan was um for, mm. for after the diagnosis as such a super fan of Bayern Munich. Mm -hmm. So let's, um, yeah, let's get it. Let's get into um, your, your diagnosis. Yeah. Um, I mean, I got diagnosed in February of 2016 with a, an extremely like ultra rare um, eye cancer, um, ocular melanoma. Honestly, at the time I'd never heard of it. Mm -hmm. Did, didn't even know eye cancer existed. Um, but the the thing was is at the times and and still to this day it's only somewhere but in the numbers of ten to twenty five maybe ten to fifteen is kind of the normal range of uh like ten to fifteen out of every million people are diagnosed with that inside the u s every year the the numbers for ocular melanoma in other nations, other countries, other continents really isn't um, something that that's really kept up with very well. Um, so we don't really know how many people get diagnosed outside of the United States on a regular basis. But the thing was is just I was uh, working uh, directing traffic and stuff like that for the uh, Clover School District and. Uh, I guess people have kind of seen the like floaty type things, you know, they look like little worms sometimes in your eye. Mm -hmm. um, and normally when you rub your eyes, they go away. Right. Um, at that, at that time I had a bunch of them and they just never went away, but it never hurt. There was never pressure or anything like that. It just slowly built from like the, the, it was, and it was my right eye. So the, the bottom right corner of my eye just started getting black. And then not really like you could, you couldn't see it that it was getting black, but just like the vision itself mm -hmm. was just going black. 
And to the point of I lost probably 50 percent of the vision in that eye before I was like, oh, maybe I've got a, an eye infection. So I'm going to go to get an eye exam done at Walmart, got the dilated pupil exam. And she started doing everything. And then she did the big for everybody that's gotten dilated pupil exams. They put that stuff in your eyes and then use that really bright light, I guess, to see the back of your eyeball. And when she did, her eyes got huge. And she's like, hold on, sit here for a minute. I'll be back. Well, everybody knows doctor's offices. The the walls are pretty thin. I can hear her on the phone talking to somebody saying, hey, um, I've heard of this, never seen it before, but I think he may need to come see you. And then there was some mumbling, and then she came back in. She's like, hey, I need you to go to the Carolina Eye uh, uh, Associates. And I was like, for what? She's like, well, you need to get your eyes checked. There may be something there that could be bad. And I was like, look, I don't have the money for that. Um, that's out of the question. It's just going to have to wait. Mm-hmm. And she's like, no, um, if you wait, it could be life threatening. Um, and when she said that, I was like, yeah, whatever. I mean, it's, it's an eye infection. What, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm still under the conclusion that it's just an eye fe- infection. And you still, I mean, you have no idea that, that this is something nah. that even exists. So why would you think even in a worst case scenario, you still aren't imagining that this could Cancer. be <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So I, I go to the, the eye, uh, the eye place. Um, the Carolina Eye uh, Institute thing in, in Rock Hill. And the guy does the same test that that lady did. And he starts putting these little things like against my eye. And he, I was like, what is that? He's like, oh, these are pressure tests and stuff. And I'm like, what in the hell is this guy putting on my eye? And so it sat in the room for a little bit. He did the bright light thing again. And he's like, I need you to sit here for a minute. I'll be back in a second. And I'm like, good God, here we go again. This dude's going to call somebody else. Well, he goes to his office in the next room over. Same, same deal. Skinny walls. And I can hear him on the phone. And he's like, I need to speak to Dr. So-and-so. Um, couldn't really get the name, but he's like um, at the the eye Institute at Duke university. Well, when I heard Duke and saw his eyes, I'm like, Okay, something's not right here, because uh, most people around here know that if a doctor refers you to Duke, you've got cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, So he comes back in. He's like, "Um, I need you to go set up an appointment with the the eye center at Duke University. Um, I think you may have a tumor in your eye. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever, bro. Well, me, I'm one of those that I need to see proof. So he pulled it up, took some pictures of my, my eye um, and showed it to me on a computer. And practically three quarters of the inside of my eyeball was a tumor. And it was sitting right on the optic nerve. And he's like, that's why you can't see hardly. Um, so waited a couple of weeks, tried to get into Duke. Um, Duke couldn't get me in in a, in a timely manner. So he's like, here, call this doctor at Wake Forest, um, and talk to uh, Dr. Fuller at the Wake Forest Eye Institute. Um, we need to get you in like ASAP. So he called them. I called them. They got me in like the very next week. Um, and by then I'd already started looking up, like just Googling like eye cancer. Which is usually the worst thing you can possibly do, right? Yeah, like, because the first thing that came up was eye cancer survival rate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> why, why in the world is if you ever Google any type of cancer, the automatic response on Google is survival rate. And it's like, okay, that's not the number I want to hear before I find out if I've literally got it. Mm-hmm. So we went up to Wake Forest. Um, me and my dad and they do practically the same tests. Um, but a a lot more of them, um, a lot different pressure tests. Um, they, I didn't know they could numb your eyeball and start poking and prodding at it, but they did. 
And uh, he comes in, he's like, yes, um, are you are you ready for the results? And I'm like, yeah, here we go. Because, like, practically I'd already had my mind made up. I've got cancer. Mm-hmm. Let's let's move on. What's the next thing? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when he said, yes, you've got ocular melanoma. Um, you've got an extremely large tumor inside your eye. Um, he's like, we've got two courses of action. And as soon as he sat there and said, you've got a large tumor in your eye, you've got cancer. That's when I kind of like glanced over my dad, even though I'm half blind in one eye. Uh, and you could tell that it hit him hard. Um, and so I'm sitting there and I know, you know what I'm saying? It, it, once you find out your kid's got cancer, that's the last thing you're going to hear of that conversation. Absolutely. Um, and so for me, it was, you already had built yourself up for this. You knew what was about to happen. Now it's your turn to tune in, to make sure you've got everything. You can't be the emotional one. You know what I'm saying? Let them be emotional. You get all the information. And basically the two courses of action was, um, plaque, um, plaque therapy, plaque radiation, however they want to call it whatever doctor you go to, um, or inoculation, which is just cut your eyeball out in, in layman's terms. Um, plaque radiation is basically they take your eye, they, and, and I know this is going to sound nasty, but to explain what plaque radiation is, you kind of have to explain it. Um, but plaque radiation, they take a little kind of gold, um, plate, um, that's about the size of a dime or a quarter, depending on what size they use. They pry your eye back, like your eyelids and all that kind of stuff, and practically sew it to the side of your eye. Um, and inside of that like little plate, they put um, radioactive seeds, which are pr- uh, essentially the size of small grains of rice um, that are radioactively charged. And they leave it in there for a couple of days um, and then take it off. And then supposedly that's supposed to um, shrink the, it's kind of like chemotherapy for your eye, basically. Mm -hmm. And the thing was, is I'd I'd done a lot of research, talked to a lot of people that had been through um, the plaque radiation. And everyone that I talked to had sit there and said, they probably are going to have to have their eye removed anyway. Um, Because, I mean, good Lord, you're you're shooting radiation directly into your eyeball. It's going to kill your eye. Um, And with the tumor the size that it was, plaque radiation would have been just prolonging the inevitable. Um, Especially with the tumor wrapped around the the optic nerve, sight wasn't going to happen. So pretty much when I got home, this happened on a Friday. I got home. Uh, my mom and dad were upset. And the, the choice that I gave them was, um, we're not going to extend this. And they didn't understand quite what I meant. And I told them, I said, I said, you have a weekend to cry. You have a weekend to cry, bitch, moan, cuss, yell, whatever you want to do. But as of Monday, when I tell that doctor I'm getting my eye cut out, it's, we need to, t- you know what I'm saying? Tighten it up. Mm-hmm. Um, because the last thing I need is a bunch of emotional responses to anything that happens. I need, you know what I'm saying? I, I need that strong support because I'm, go- you know what I'm saying? I'm going through a losing a body part. Right. Um, so I gave him the weekend and that Monday we, called the doctor and told them, Hey, we're not going to do the plaque. We're just going to do removing the eye and was hoping that that would be the best way. You know what I'm saying? Instead of keeping a tumor inside your body, just eradicate the tumor. Even if it comes to losing your eye as well. So that that's the decision we made. The doctor kept saying, Hey, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure. And I finally had to tell the doctor, just shut the hell up. This is my decision. That's what I went with. Um, so, that was February, the end of February, early March, um, is when I went up for the, the surgery. 
that went kind of sideways because I, I, I didn't have any insurance, which is why a lot of the previous stuff I wanted to push off because well, I didn't have the money for it. Right. Well, I, an eye inoculation ain't cheap. <laughs> um, it's close to sixty, seventy thousand dollars surgery. Wow. Um, but because we didn't have insurance for paying cash, um, we got a, a pretty good discount. Um, and I mean, my dad had to cash in a, a 401k to pay for it. I gave him every dime that I had to get it done. Um, so we, we finally got through all the financial red tape to get it done and got my eye cut out, um, around the 11th, 11th to 15th of March of 2016. And that's pretty much what led me into the prosthetic eye, um, that I had to get made on May 20th. So, and the prosthetic eye that you decided to go with is instead of having a prosthetic eye that looks like a regular eyeball, you know, with the pupil and everything, um, you went with one that has the Bayern Munich logo on it. And Mm -hmm. Why is it that you made this decision? Um, that decision actually for me was pretty simple. Um, the minute I knew I was going to get my eye cut out was the minute I knew I was going to get a Bayern Munich eye. Um, I did my research, checked it. Nobody has ever had a Bayern Munich prosthetic eye. Um, there's very few people that have prosthetic eyes of, soccer teams or teams period. Um, or you hear about the, the occasional person that has, Oh, he's got this person has this eye or this eye or this eye, but they're, you know what I'm saying? They're for specific occasions. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what I'm saying? They're, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're, they're, they're everyday eye is a regular prosthetic. Um, if they go to a, a football game, they might put in a, a Seattle Seahawks or a Kansas city chiefs or, you know what I'm saying? Something along those lines. Right. Um, but they, they don't wear them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. For me, that that uh, I could only afford one eye. Mm-hmm. So it was Bayern Munich eye. Um, the, and the, the original plan was try to find out how much a prosthetic eye cost, which a regular prosthetic eye can run upwards of ten fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. Um, And then you can kind of haggle and waggle for, for some things. Um, but the thing was, is once I, I made my mind up, I told my mom, this is what I'm making. This is what I'm getting done. Um, it took a lot of coercing her because she wanted like, Hey, we want you to, to look normal. Um, look like you used to, you know what I'm saying? The Mm -hmm. the typical thing of a, of a parent. Um, she didn't want me to like get made fun of or anything like that. Like, obviously mom, you don't know who I am, but, uh, (laughs) but basically I told her, I was like, look, we're, we're getting a Bayern Munich. Um, it's, it's drastically cheaper, um, compared to a regular eye. And then I explained to her why I, I I'm getting it. And she kind of laughed at me um, when I when I told her the the deep reason why I was getting it. Um, and then I explained that to the doctor um, because right before you get your prosthetic, you go back to the the surgeon. They check everything, make sure you're ready to get the prosthetic. Told her she's like, "No, you need to get a regular prosthetic so you can fit back into society and be normal." everybody wanted me to go back into back into normality. Um, so I didn't stand out. So I wouldn't be like the oddball. Normality sucks. Um, nobody's ever made an impact in life being normal. So when I explained it to my mom, that's how I explained it. Um, normality sucks. You, you can be normal, be average, you're never going to make an impact on the world. If I get a Bayern Munich eyeball, I'm practically shunning normality. 
I'm, I'm putting myself out there um, with a Bayern Munich eyeball. Instantly, it's a, it's a conversation piece. So I walk up and say hey to somebody. They look at me weird, and they're like, dude, what, what's up with your eye? And then that opens up the door to explaining who Bayern Munich is, what Bayern Munich is, um, explaining the passion and, and fandom of Bayern Munich, as well as it, it opens the door for a conversation that eventually, if you talk about Bayern Munich and stuff like that about your eye, there's going to come that time when they're like, well, what happened? How'd you lose it? Mm -hmm. And that opens you up to practically being able to bring awareness to an ultra rare cancer. That's what I was just Um, thinking. I was literally just thinking that as you were telling this story, because now, you know, this was a disease that you, before you were diagnosed with it, you knew nothing about, you'd never even heard of it. And now you have an opportunity to have this conversation and share this with people and bring more awareness to something Mm -hmm. that is, you know, yes, very rare, but it's still something that is very real. Yeah. I mean, you're the, the other thought process, because before all of this happened, I, I did sports marketing. Um, I did sponsorships and endorsements for MMA athletes, soccer athletes, stuff like that. So I knew if you're a walking billboard, like an MMA fighter is, Mm -hmm. or like, like any athlete is on social media, you, you're walking billboard for that company for that, whatever. So my thing, my thought process was I'm a walking billboard for Bayern Munich. So I can bring awareness to that. And then I can bring awareness to ocular melanoma because they're going to ask, bro, what happened with your eye? Mm -hmm. And when I say, bro, what happened to your eye? It's normally that that's the exact words that are used. Um, or they just are like, Oh shit, what the hell? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That, that kind of scared type thing. And the, the, the biggest issue that I had with it was, Originally, people, <laughs> it's weird in, at this time in 2016, 2017-ish type time frame for people not to ask that type of stuff. It was like they were trying overly to be polite and not ask. Mm-hmm. And I had to have that that heart-to-heart with myself to sit there and say, Ryan, there, you only got one eye. So you can see when they're just look, when they're, you know, I'm saying when somebody's not looking you in the eye and you have two eyes, it's hard to decipher where they're looking. When you only see it from one side, you know, they're looking at your eye. So it was that heart to heart of Ryan, you may have to tell them it's okay. You can ask because you know, they're looking at it. And I had to break that stigma of where people are curious to ask why you're in a wheelchair or why you've got crutches, why this, why that they want to inquire about the the health type thing or the, or the abnormalities um, as, as some people had put it at the time. So I told them it's okay. You can ask. Or uh, uh, I mean, if I wanted to be a jerk about it, I'd sit there and say, how many times you're going to look at it before you ask? You know what I'm saying? Because the thing was, is it's like I would hand around to it and they would keep tiptoeing around it. And then I'd have to just sit there and say, dude, you don't have to look at it. You can ask. And how did that, like, how did that make you feel to, to be able to, to do that and, and, and to almost invite people to ask about it? Because I'm sure it didn't feel that way at first or did it? Um, I mean, the thing was, is it's, for me, once it once I got it and what transpired after I got it, um, and I'll get to that here uh, after I, I explain that part. Um, but the thing was, is once I got it, there was a lot of people. Um, you could tell, like friends and uh, people that I've come in contact with, they would want to make eye jokes 
or you know what I'm saying? They would tiptoe around eye jokes or tiptoe around eye puns. So with with that type of thing, you just got to you knew what you were taking you on in the first place. So you knew you were about to be the center of attention or you were kind of asking for that attention by getting a prosthetic eye that wasn't a plain prosthetic eye. So you kind of were walking into that, that storm already knowing, Hey, this is what's going to happen. You just better be prepared for it. Um, but once the, once I'd gotten permission from the club, uh, which I, I, being in sports marketing, I knew that it was a registered trademark and needed permission from Bayern Munich to get it um, because they wouldn't have done anything to me. The the ocularist that did it, she could have potentially gotten sued for selling me a medical device with a Bayern Munich logo on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and they own a international patent on medical devices. So I got the I got the permission from the club um, through the U.S. office. They got it the permission from Munich, which surprisingly only took about a week, week and a half. Um, I was expecting it to take longer, but I think it was just one of those. This is kind of an odd request. We don't really know <laughs> what what's going on with it, but okay. So they sent me a letter back with a or sent me an email back with a letterhead with the permission. Um, and then they gave me kind of like a stipulations type contract, um, that I couldn't make money off of it. Um, I had to call it a specific thing. I couldn't call it this, couldn't call it that. Um, so, I mean, it's, I I was expecting all of that. Um, and then I started posting on Instagram and Facebook. Well, mainly on Facebook, the, um, the updates, like as she was making it, um, I was like, Hey, I'm at the doctor, took a picture of me at the doctor. I was like, Hey, I'm getting fitted. You know what I'm saying? The, the typical things of, Hey, I want to show this to everybody. Um, and I kind of only thought like, Hey, the hundred or so Bayern fans that are on my Facebook would, you know what I'm saying? Pick up on it. Um, Posted a couple of times on Twitter, and then all of a sudden I got a message from uh, Christian Niari, who's the, who at the time is the was the social media guy for for Bayern Munich in the U.S. And he's like, "Hey Ryan, stop! I'm like, stop what?" He's like, "Stop! Stop posting updates." I was like, um, "No." <laughs> I was like, "I'm I'm already this far in. I'm going to keep going." He's like, "No, there's going to be a guy that's going to contact you. Um, I need your permission for him to call you." Um, he wants to do like an exclusive reveal of your eye. And I'm like, okay, what, whatever that means. Um, and it was a guy named Rada. I guess that's how you pronounce his name, Rada, Rita. Um, but he was out of New York. He worked for gold.com, which is at the time I knew of gold.com. I read a lot of their articles, followed like their apps and stuff like that, but didn't realize it's the second largest website as far as like inter, uh, like internet traffic behind CNN um, in the world. So it, it's a pretty big site. And he called me on the ride home after I'd already gotten it. And I, you know what I'm saying? I'm a goofball. So I took different, pretending like I was modeling with it, all this kind of stuff. And uh, he's like, yeah, uh, don't post anymore about it. Send me the pictures. I'm going to do a quick interview. We did the interview on the way home. He's like, um, tomorrow Bayern Munich plays in the, I think it was the Super Cup that day against uh, Borussia Dortmund. He's like, go to the bar, take some pictures, send them to me, don't post them. And I was like, okay, why? He's like, because we're, we're going to debut your eye on Monday. I was like, okay. So I go to the bar, all the people at the, like the friends and stuff like that that are Bayern Munich fans, Dortmund fans, um, English Premier League fans, they all look at my they're freaking out. <laughs> like it's the coolest thing they've ever seen. And uh, I was like, but don't post anything, guys. There's a, there's a guy at Goal.com that wants to post it. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I, I 
he gets a few people to read it, a few people to think it is cool. Well, that Monday, then the story came out. Once the story came out, then it went all balls to the wall. Was not expecting what happened. Um, it went from zero to a thousand, like miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, I was getting friend requests on Facebook, follows on Twitter, uh, mentions on Twitter from God knows what language, country. Um, my my Instagram shot up. Um, and the, the name Byron Ryan came about from that actual article. Um, that's what he called me in there. So once he called me that, it's one of the, you know what I'm saying? You, you can't give yourself a nickname. Somebody else has to give you a nickname. So he was the one that actually donned that name. Um, and then Christian's like, Hey, do you mind if uh, Fox um, Fox Soccer does a um, like quick little, I think it was a 30, 35 second little video with uh, Rachel Bonetta um, covering it and all that kind of stuff. I was like, dude, do what you want. I was like, it's already superseded like way beyond my expectations. I was like, I just wanted Bayern Munich to like retweet just a picture. <laughs> like I wasn't, wasn't expecting all of this. <laughs> I, I mean, I was getting phone calls from different people that wanted to do this and wanted to talk to me about that or, you know, I'm saying everything. So they did that video when that video dropped, then, you know what I'm saying? It was like the second wave of everything came out and it, it just snowballed from there to, um, uh, what was it? Copa 90 did a thing um, because I'd never seen Bayern Munich play in a competitive match. Um, and this was after Bayern Munich came to Charlotte and played a, a preseason match in Charlotte. Um, a couple of friends of mine worked with uh, Heineken to get it where I could flip the coin before that, uh, before that match. So I was on the field, flip the coin for that. But the coolest thing was, is like, that was maybe a few months after the the articles and some of the videos had come out. And you had Bayern Munich fans from all over the country and stuff like that come into Charlotte. And everybody wanted to take selfies with me. Everybody wanted to take pictures with me and stuff like that. So it was like everywhere I would walk, there would be a camera in my face. And I was like, this is freaking nuts. <laughs> I was like, I, I did not expect all of this to come from, you know what I'm saying, one man, mm-hmm. one eye, one disease to have all of this stuff. And so, I mean, more people were were finding out about um, ocular melanoma and finding out about my eye and just more and more awareness was coming from this. And Copa 90, which is a kind of like a, a fan-driven um, uh, social media company. They make a lot of videos and stuff. They uh, contacted me and was like, hey, have you ever seen Bayern Munich play in a competitive match? I was like, no. I've seen them on TV a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've seen them in a preseason match, but I've never literally seen them play in Europe just strictly because finances never worked out that way. Right. Um, traveling to Germany or anywhere in Europe, it's not cheap. So they sat there and said, hey, um, we're going to do a feature on you for the Champions League, um, which is kind of like the uh, all the champions of all the different leagues um, kind of play in a tournament to find out who's the best in Europe is quick, fast way of explaining the Champions League. Um, so they did a quick little video, you know, what I'm saying just a, it was a minute long. And it got like 10 or 15 million views and people were like freaking out. They were like, dude, that is the coolest thing we've ever seen. Well, for the second leg, because you play two games and whoever has the most goals over the two legs moves on to the next round. Well, we were playing Arsenal um, out of London and Copa 90 had such a response to my video. They were like, hey, we want to 
we want to do a, a follow-up I'm like okay uh tell me what questions you want me to answer um what videos pictures you want me to send you they're like um we need you to, which do you have a passport and i was like no <laughs> never really needed one um so they're like hey we need you to get a passport um we're gonna fly you to london to watch Bayern munich play arsenal in the uh the second leg we're going to fly you to london for a week um you can see the sites um we'll do some interviews with you um the the red dragons of london which is a, a Bayern munich supporters group um in london they're going to have a big party you're going to be there um and we're going to introduce you to uh michael zeman who everybody in the Bayern munich world knows as the Bayern bushman um he has a bunch of Bayern scarves. He's essentially the world's most famous Bayern Munich fan. Um, so they flew me to London. I got to watch the game with with Michael. Uh, when I met him the first time, I broke down. He broke down. I mean, we were sobbing. Um, so, I mean, that was the first time I got to watch Bayern Munich and was surrounded by european fans versus you know what i'm saying the charlotte group or the new york group or you know what i'm saying stuff like that in in the u.s so i mean it and and after that it just kept going you know what i'm saying it was just one of those things that just kept every time i would think it was gonna slow down somebody else would contact me um comcast uh came and did a like a short documentary type thing on it um we filmed for like four or five days um and they were going to do it for some world cup coverage in 2018 filmed it in 2017 they did some stuff um bleacher report came and and dw sports um or deutsch or Deutsche Vela, however the hell they want to call it. Um, they did a lot of stuff after the next hurdle that I had to go through in life. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it kind of was crazy there from, from 2016, 2017. It was just kind of like a wild ride. Um, I mean, nothing really set in. It was like, hey, you've got cancer. You're, do, you're, you're going and getting scans done every three months. Um, but it was just kind of like a wild ride that it was like, this is awesome. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you just never wanted to end. But then December 31st, 2017 happened. And that sent everything into a downward spiral of emotions and kind of, uh, self uh i mean just kind of trying to pick yourself back up um self-reflection that type of stuff so that is it that is the first half of ryan's interview here on the podcast now ryan did leave his instagram name and everything in the final part of episode of the second half of this episode um but if need be you can check the show notes and go ahead and follow him let him know that you heard the first half of this story and um you will definitely be tuning in for the second or what you thought um or if there's anything he loves getting connected with new people so definitely reach out to him I will be posting the second half of this episode on Thursday. So this is going up on Tuesday. If you are hearing it after that, the second half will be posted on Thursday. And obviously, if you are hearing it after that, both of them will be posted. So thanks so much for hanging out with us. And I hope that you come back for the second half.